And they said it was a joy to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. What a privilege we get on this special Sabbath day to gather in his house, in his name, with his presence here with us. And we know he is here with us because we've been asking not only right now and not only this morning, we have a prayer time before our service begins, but all week long we've been asking that God will uh, have an encounter with each one of us here this morning. You've heard me say it many times from this pulpit, it's easy for church to become routine and it's just what we do and we go through the motions, we sit when we're supposed to sit, we stand when we're supposed to stand, we leave when we're supposed to leave, right? But church is so much bigger than that. Church is about coming in and experiencing God's presence. And where God's presence is, that's where peace and joy and love, patience, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering, and self-control, all of these things, that's where they dwell. And so I pray that you will have that experience with us at the Crowley Seventh-day Adventist Church this morning. I'm indeed glad that you all are here. And I forgot my basketball. I got to get it. I got to show you my basketball. You have to see it this morning. I assume you all have seen a, a basketball before, right? So it's not that I needed to give you the illustration of what it is, but I watched a video this week uh, that's illustrative of this basketball. It was one of the most amazing things I think I've seen in a long time. It's a blind basketball league. And I said, how in the world are blind folk playing basketball? I got to watch this video. You know, some of these things pop up on your, your feed and you say, I got to watch this. And so what they do is when one team is bringing the ball down court, there'll be folk on the other side with sticks that are making sounds, tapping sounds on where they are. And so they're following the sound to get up and down the court on both ways. When they get close to the basket and they're ready to shoot, they move from tapping on the floor or the wall on that side to start tapping on the backboard. And depending on where on the backboard they're tapping from, they're able to hear where they need to shoot the shot. That's incredible, right? I, I never would have pictured blind folk playing basketball, many other things, but not basketball. But they said, hey, we wanted to overcome that and this is the way they did it. So they play basketball with their ears. I think basketball is hard enough with having all of your senses, right? But this was an amazing video to see that they can overcome blindness to play basketball. And I share that with you this morning because the story we're looking at is a type of blindness that cannot be overcome no matter how much tapping or uh, ingenuity is used to tr try to have it happen. We're in the book of 2 Kings this morning talking about a type of blindness that all of us have suffered from at some point or another, and that is spiritual blindness spiritual blindness. And this is a fascinating story. This is one of my favorite stories in Scripture, especially growing up. I love to imagine and picture this story. Uh, this is after Elijah has left. Elisha said, I want a double portion of your spirit or the Holy Spirit. And he's given a double portion of the Holy Spirit. He's able to do amazing things. Just before this in 2 Kings chapter 6, a steel axe head or an iron axe head is being used to cut down a tree. And what happens? It falls into the water they pray over it, and the axe head begins floating, right? Supernatural stuff. My kids love when we walk around Bailey Lake to play the game. Daddy, will it sink or will it float, right? And they'll go and grab a rock, and they'll be like, Daddy, I bet this will float, won't it? And I'm like, well, I don't think so. I bet that one will sink. And they throw it in, and what happens? It sinks. And so I said, oh, how'd you get that right? And then they'll go and grab another rock. What about this one? Will this one sink or float, right? And I'm like, well, I think we learned that lesson already. So they'll grab a stick. Ah, oh, Daddy, we got you on this one. Is it going to sink or float? I bet you're going to say it's going to sink because the rock sunk, right? Well, no, it floats. And this is the, the supernatural miracle that we begin 2 Kings chapter 6 with is this iron axe head floats in the water, should not float. I would have gotten that game wrong with my boys, but that's the supernatural environment that is the person of Elisha and the things that he does. One of my favorite stories about him follows, starting with verse 8. And this is what the Bible says. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, starting with verse 8. It says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. I don't know about you, but I appreciate such and such a place, right? Because most of these Old Testament city names, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's try to pronounce it together, right? This one, they're like, we're not even trying. I'm just going to be in such and such a place, right? It doesn't matter where I'm going to be. I'm just going to be there, right? I'm going to be there. I like what the Bible says here. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, 
Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Again, I love this story. It says, hey, go in such and such a place. Hey, they went to that place. They avoided that place. They were watchful of that place, right? I can, I can get behind this. This is what happens, verse 11. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of the servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha. He said, hey, I think we have a mole, right? I think we have a rat within our, our group who's telling them where we're going to be. Who is it? And they said, hey, it's not any of us. We're not sympathizers with Israel. It's rather that they have a prophet named Elijah. That's what's taking place. It says, the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom, I like how plain this story is made. It says, hey, Prophet Elijah knows your thoughts. He knows what you're saying. He knows those things that you're speaking. Again, not because of himself, but because he's speaking on behalf of God and you're attacking God's people. It's an amazing, amazing story. Verse 13. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servants of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? I love to, to picture this story because, to be honest with you, I mentioned a, a video that I watched about blindness. I'm going to use a video as an illustration later. I like to watch videos. I like to picture it. I like to see it. And I picture this as a movie. I picture this as some kind of story that's taking place. The king gets so frustrated that Israel keeps knowing where they're going to be and what their plans are that he says, hey, we are going to take out the king's prophet, the king's mouthpiece who keeps snitching on our plans, right? That's what's taking place in this story. So the king sends an entire army. It says chariots and army men, right? He surrounds the city where the prophet lives. And you can almost picture this, right? The scene of the movie, the, the sun comes up over the tent and the servant of Elisha walks out to go and begin the daily chores, whatever it was. He takes one or two steps out. He looks up and there's an army surrounding the hill of which this tent is. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Can you imagine this with me? I imagine either he steps backwards into the tent or he turns and he runs quickly back into the tent. He said, Elisha, they're surrounding us. What is it that we're going to do? So he answered, do not fear. Do not fear. This is an amazing line of Old Testament scripture that's repeated over and over. In the face of armies, in the face of all odds being against them, God's people continually say, do not fear fear. There's probably a sermon and a lesson in that for us this morning. What is it that you look at and are overwhelmed by? God says, do not fear. Do not be overwhelmed by that. Do not fear. Why? This is what Elisha says to him. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I imagine the servant scratching his head saying, Elisha, it's you and it's me and there's an army up there, right? I imagine him saying, well, there's a couple of other people in town, but that's an entire army. And it said, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of what? Horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. What a random story of Scripture, right? If you're surrounded by an army, what is your prayer? Lord, protect me. Lord, keep me safe. Maybe you remember the story of, uh, of Samson, right? And you're looking for that donkey, donkey's jawbone, right? Somehow the jawbone can take out a thousand Philistines, right? So you're looking for that weapon or that armament. He says, hey... Don't worry, because those that are with us are more than those that are against us. And what happens as they begin rushing down, he simply says a quick prayer and says, God, strike them with blindness. What a prayer of faith. There's two things that happen with blindness in this chapter. The first is the servant of Elisha had what we call spiritual 
blindness, right? This is what all of us have suffered from at some point or are currently suffering from even right now, is spiritual blindness does not allow us to see the spiritual realities around us. It only allows us to see the obstacles and the challenges that are constantly be facing us. But here, Elisha's prayer for his own servant was, Lord, open his eyes. Just let him see the reality. This prayer implies that Elisha already saw all of those things, right? He already saw the chariots, the army of God, the, the fire, right, as it talks about. He already saw that. That was his reality because his eyes were already opened and his prayer said, hey, let my servant see things how I see them as well. And then the amazing thing about this is as the army comes to attack, he doesn't say, okay, Lord's army, go and attack them, kill them, defend us, protect us. He simply says, hey, strike them with blindness, Strike them with blindness. There's a story that I have to tell this morning. I usually save it for uh, illustrations when I talk with pastors or I'm using it for a mentoring story with young pastors. But there's a friend of mine who pastored uh, up in North Dallas. And again, you kind of have to know the person to understand the full context of this. It probably won't make much sense this morning. But I want you to hear the prayers of boldness sometimes don't have to make sense as we think of them. The prayer of strike them with blindness would not be the prayer most of us would pray. Lord, attack. Lord, sick them. Lord, get them, right? Lord, protect us, not strike them with blindness. So he was pastoring a church, and this church, by God's grace, was growing. And every week there were more and more people that were coming to this church. And as the problem with many of our churches in larger cities is there's never enough parking within these churches' parking lots. And so church folk begin to park in front of neighbors' houses, and sometimes neighbors get upset. They can't back out of their driveways easily, or there's cars lining both sides of the street. And so this one neighbor just kept getting irritated about all of these cars that just kept coming and blocking his view of his street and blocking his mailbox and all of these things, right? So week after week, he comes to the church, and he starts yelling in the church parking lot, move your cars, get out of the way, I can't drive my car, right? And it becomes this nuisance because especially as new people are coming to the church. And so my friend as a pastor would go out and would try to talk with him. Hey, brother, we, we understand it's an inconvenience. We're only here for a few hours on Saturday mornings. Can you, can you work with us? Can you help us? Uh, what if we put cones in front of your house to block it off? Would that help? And just agitated and angry. And finally, after many, many weeks of talking with him, of reasoning with him, of trying to work out solutions, one time he just said, I had enough. And he said, as we were talking in the parking lot, he said, if you don't stop attacking God's people, I'm going to pray that you get prostate cancer. And that was the end of the conversation, and the man never came over again and said anything about the cars that were there, and more cars kept coming every single week. I said, Pastor, what kind of a prayer is that? That's the strangest thing I've ever heard anyone say. He said, I don't know. I was moved by the Holy Spirit that enough was enough, and I knew he wouldn't want to get that, so he stopped coming over and attacking the church. I said, that is a strange prayer of boldness. But sometimes when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will pray strange prayers. Lord, strike them with blindness. Sometimes you all need to hear the Gates' story of when they were held up at gunpoint and what the, the possible options were and Philip's solution of, can I pray for you? It's an amazing story. It's an amazing testimony of praying for the person that had a gun pointed right at them. It's amazing Holy Spirit boldness of what comes in those moments. So don't pray for anyone to get any form of cancer. Pray for people's cancer to go away. But if the Holy Spirit leads, step forward in boldness. Elijah's prayer was, strike them with blindness. And I love how this story continues, right? Strike them with blindness, I pray. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. That's such an amazing thing. Elisha had such a connection with God, such a faith with God, that the Bible writes it in such a way that says, because Elisha asked it, God was willing to do it. But that's amazing. And you know how this story continues. It says, now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man of whom you seek. Again, sometimes there's some humor within the prophets of God or the mouthpiece of God. Who are they looking for? For him. And he says, hey, he's not here. He's over there. Let's go. Let me take you for a walk, right? You can picture this, a whole army, uh, rough guys, tough guys being led by the hand. And where does he lead them? It says, so when they had come to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of this man that they may see. 
the Lord opened their eyes and saw that they were inside of Samaria. They were surrounded now by the Lord's army. He walked them right into the middle of the Lord's army. Now, when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them, right? There's almost this excitement. Hey, you've delivered them into our hands. Shall I kill them? I want to. Let me do it, right? This is how I read it. He said, but he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those with whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Instead, set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. I love this story for so many reasons, and I, I want to spend more time on it this morning, but I think it's fascinating because it shows a different picture of the God of the Old Testament that many people think of just wiping out people and desecrating nations and whatnot. Here's an example of God extending mercy to this defenseless army that was now surrounded by God's people, and instead of not killing them, they throw them a feast, they throw them a banquet, they show them such a, a hospitable time that it said they were not bothered ever again. The reason I share this story with you is the prayer, Lord, open my servant's eyes. I think it's a prayer that we need to pray far more often because there's two, again, blindnesses that take place in this story. One is spiritual blindness, not being able to see the realities of what God is doing. And the second is physical blindness. Physical blindness can be overcome. Spiritual blindness... It's tough. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes energy. So this is my question for you. What happened if Elisha prayed that prayer over you and over me? What would we see? Lord, open their eyes. What would we see? I have three points or three pictures for you this morning of things that I think we would see if God opened our eyes. The first is found in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, you know this passage of Scripture well. My Bible heading says the whole armor of God. And in the middle of this passage of the whole armor of God is verse 12, which he says, For we wrestle against, do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but rather against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You've heard this passage quoted often. You've heard it mentioned. But I think it's fascinating that it's in the middle of talking about putting on the whole armor of God. You see, when our eyes are opened, we see the spiritual realities around us are not wrestling against flesh and blood, or not wrestling against one another, or not wrestling with our boss or our neighbor or our coworker, or Lord have mercy, our spouse or our children. Rather, we're wrestling against something that's far greater. And when God opens our eyes, we see that all of those things around us are spiritual realities that God is trying to work for our good, but we're so fixated in our spiritual blindness on the problem that's right in front of us that sometimes we have a hard time realizing, could the devil be using this situation to bring discouragement to me or discouragement to those around me? One of the things that I love and I affirm about the Crowley Seventh-day Adventist Church is we're always looking, God, where are you leading? God, what are you doing? What are you doing behind the scenes that we need to be aware of? Because while there are small challenges and small obstacles that we work through, our focus is on what is God up to in the midst of this situation? What is God trying to teach us from this situation? And this is amazing because when we pray the prayer, Lord, open our eyes, we see that we're not wrestling against one another, but rather we're wrestling against the enemy, the adversary, the one who constantly seeks to discourage, to belittle, to break down, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. We're wrestling against principalities. We're wrestling against powers. We're wrestling against rulers of the darkness of this age. One of the questions can become, do I know if I'm seeing with spiritual eyesight or physical eyesight, or how are the things that I'm seeing take place in the world around me affecting my emotions? Am I getting agitated? Am I getting angry? Am I getting upset? Right? 
that's looking with our physical eyes. When we look with our spiritual eyes, we say, God, how is this playing into the plan of salvation? God, how is this playing into the great controversy theme? How is this part of prophetic fulfillment in which as a group of seventh Adventists, we know things will get worse? That's looking with spiritual eyesight. We know this passage of Scripture well that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but it only makes sense in the context when you put on the whole armor of God. Just because you can see the spiritual realities and the spiritual warfare around you does not mean that you are equipped to handle it on your own. You see, the reality of what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6 is it takes work, it takes time every day to put on the whole armor of God. It would be far easier to say, you know what? Today's not going to be too bad. There's not going to be too many challenges that I face. Let me just leave the shield at home, right? The shield is heavy, right? Well, you know what? I'm not planning to go to war today. I'm not planning to go to battle today. Let me just leave the sword at home, right? I'll wear the helmet just in case, or I'll wear the breastplate just in case, but let me leave those other things at home because those things weigh me down. But the reality of what he's saying is when you see the warfare that is raging around you, you run to your closet and you put on the whole armor of God because you say, I cannot enter the battlefield without one piece of vital equipment. You're not running to the front line saying, oh, I don't need my helmet, right? Uh, Jimmy, as a soldier, right, were you saying, oh, I don't need my rucksack, right? I don't need the extra ammunition that's in my bag. Leave that at home, right? Oh, an extra battery for my radio? I don't need to call anybody, right? No, you're saying, give it to me, right? I need everything that I can take. And you're lugging 70 pounds or more of stuff because you say, I need to be prepared as I can when going to the front lines of battle. When our eyes are open, we realize that there's a constant battle raging around us. We say, I don't dare leave home without the armor of God. I don't dare leave the shield leaning against the wall because I said, hey, we're in a moment of peace. Paul is saying you do all of this so that you can withstand the fiery darts of the adversary. Praying the prayer, Lord, open my eyes gives us the ability to see the war and be prepared to put on the armor every single day. The amazing thing about this, and I've shared this with you before, is the armor is not just a defensive tool as well. And I know this because Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, put on the armor so you can withstand the attacks so that you can keep speaking boldly moving forward. Part of the challenge of why it's hard to pray bold prayers, part of the reason why it's a challenge to have a bold faith, to practice a bold faith, is if our eyes are blind from the jump, We don't put on the armor, which enables us then to move forward and pray the prayer in the first place. Part of the reason to wear God's armor is so that we can speak with holy boldness to a world that is crumbling around us. God's armor gives us defenses against the devil, but it also puts us on the offensive against the gates of hell. Even the gates of hell shall not prevail. Talk with holy boldness. Elisha prayed, strike the people with blindness. If you see the reality of the war around you, if you're equipped to be able to handle the war around you, then what do you do in the war? You speak with boldness. You go on the missions that God has for you. You're able to face whatever the enemy throws at you because you say, with the Lord on my side, we far outnumber anything else. My question for you this morning, Crowley family, is when is the last time you prayed such a bold prayer? Either Lord, open my eyes, or Lord, strike them with blindness. When's the last time you prayed such a bold prayer? Another example of putting on the armor of God daily in response to having our eyes opened is seen in our very prayer life. What does our prayer life even look like? Craig Groeschel, in his book, Dangerous Prayers, asks the following question. What if, instead of always asking God to do something on our behalf, 
we dared to ask God to use us on his behalf. What if instead of asking God to do something for me or for those that I care about, we said, God, use me to do something good for those that you care about? That's a bold prayer. That's a hard prayer to pray because we don't know then what those steps look like. We don't know what the action items are, but the reality becomes it doesn't matter because we're equipped with whatever should come our way. We're ready to face whatever comes our way. When is the last time you've prayed such a bold prayer? When you pray the prayer, open my eyes, Lord, what else might it look like? With boldness, we're able to call people out of the brokenness of the world. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, one I've preached on many, many times. You know, this is the, the model church that we would love to look like, to resemble, to function like. But it's so fascinating how they got to that point. It wasn't that the leaders sat down and said, okay, we need more time in prayer, or we need more food, or we need to do miracles. It had nothing to do with any of that. The early church grew 3,000 people in one day because of somebody's eyes being open and praying a bold prayer, Lord, open my eyes. This is what it was. Verse 40 of chapter 2, it says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from what? Be saved from this perverse generation. Other translations say this crooked generation. This is a fascinating thing. Peter is standing up there. Peter, who just denied Jesus. Peter, who just walked away. Peter, who was peeking in the gates to say, I'm close, but I'm not there. Peter, right? scared Peter who ran away, is now standing up in front of people saying, you need to get out of this perverse generation. He's saying you need to stop thinking like the news wants you to think. You need to stop thinking like the media is influencing you to think. You need to stop thinking like your neighbors think or your society thinks or your culture thinks or your Texan core values think. You need to stop thinking like all of those things, and you need to think with biblical clarity. You need to think with biblical purpose. How do I know that? Because this is what he says. He says, he exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation that you are in. And the amazing thing about this bold call to leave the norm of the day and to be able to identify with Jesus and his movement is it says 3,000 people responded to that call and instead of living life like everyone else around them, they started a new way of life, which is what we see the early church looking like, which is Acts 42, 42 through 47. They worshiped, they fellowshiped, they spent time in each other's homes, they ate together, they prayed together. Miracles and wonders were done because they were clothed in the armor of God. They were moving forward in boldness, and their message was, come out of her, my people, right? Come out of this perverse, this crooked generation. And we intuitively understand this as Adventists because our message as the second angel's message is, come out of her, my people. Come out of what? Come out of Babylon. Come out of confusion. Come out of brokenness, out of crookedness, right? The gospel that we preach is one of wholeness, is one of truth, is one that leads to everlasting life. But sometimes it becomes hard for us as a people to say with boldness, hey, come out of that way of thinking and to be able to definitively say this way of life is better. Not because it's mine, not because I've figured it all out, but because God has restored me, God has renewed me, God has given me a purpose to be able to call people out into something better. Is it possible that because of spiritual blindness, God's people are afraid to call others out of where they are at? Part of the reality of life that we live in today that pervades even church thinking is you do what's right for you and I'll do what's right for me. How many of you have ever fallen victim to that kind of thinking? Well, it might not be my choice, but I'll let them do it, right? All of us. That's the reality. When in biblical terms, we're supposed to say, come out of that, right? Now, you have to do it in wisdom. You have to do it in, in love. You have to do it in care. But not calling them out of confusion, not calling them out of whatever it is that they are stuck in is not really loving them. It's letting them end up in that place and we praise God because somebody with boldness at some point has called, called us out of that. 
but because it's easy for our eyelids to slowly close over time and for spiritual blindness to take us over once again because we love comfort more than anything else, we then don't in turn call other people out of their spiritual blindness. I love this passage of Scripture so well because it says Peter stood up there and he preached with boldness, come out of this perverse, this crooked generation. The Greek word that is used for perverse or for crooked, uh, tell me what English word comes to your mind, is scolios. Scolios. Scoliosis. That's where the Greek word comes from. And what is scoliosis? Curvature of the spine. Uh, Jason, when the back's not working correctly, is it easy? No, not at all. Uh, Jason threw out his back this last week and thankful that there's a PT in the family to work with him, but it's not been easy. And anyone who's had back pain understands the challenges of having back pain. And I know many of you in this room deal with debilitating back pain, sometimes to the point of not being able to get up or not being able to sit down, whatever the case may be, debilitating, crippling. And this is the word that... uh, Um, Luke chooses to use in the book of Acts, talking about this sermon that Peter gave. He said, come out of this scoliosis culture. Come out of this culture that normalizes things not being straight as they should. The human body is amazing. The human body can have you function with a crooked back to the point that you don't even necessarily realize that it's not normal. I watched another video. I said I was mentioning another video. I watched a video this week that was from a a physical therapist that said folk who are healthy need to go to PTs as well. Why? Because they can increase your flexibility. They can increase your movement. They can increase uh, your strength, right? The body is amazing at adapting to even how it should not be, that you can have a curvature in your spine and muscles on one side will loosen while the other side will pull. And you'll be able to function to a point, not even realizing that there's a curvature in your back. This is the spiritual reality in which we live as well. As society is fantastic about having things crooked and out of place and not in line with what God's word would be. And saying, hey, this is normal. This is working for us. And Peter stands up and says, no, get out of that crooked, perverse, scoliosis society. It doesn't take a lot to realize that society is a little bit crooked, right? Going not quite on the right path. The problem becomes when that crookedness comes into the church. We need to pray the prayer, Lord, open our eyes and give us a holy boldness to call those things by their right name. Luke chapter 3, 5, you know this passage of scripture. It says, every valley will be filled and every mountain hill shall be brought low and the crooked places... The scoliosis, what? Shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be smooth. It's amazing when our eyes are open and we see the spiritual realities around us, how off then society looks. If our eyes were opened, if we prayed the prayer, what else might we see? This one's my favorite. When our eyes are open, we're able to see what God is up to. You see, when we're spiritually blind, we don't see how God is working. We don't see the movement of the Holy Spirit. When our eyes are closed, we see problems. We see challenges. We see obstacles. But when our eyes are open and we see those fiery chariots all around us, we say, wow, God, thank you for those things that you are up to. There's a biblical story that illustrates this as well. Luke chapter 5. This is our last passage for this morning. Luke chapter 5, there's a group of fishermen who are out fishing all night long. The Bible makes it seem like they worked really, really hard. They pull their boats into dock and they start mending and cleaning their nets. Jesus is there at that point. There's a crowd that's surrounding him. So Jesus gets into the boat to give some distance for his voice to be able to carry over the water. And he begins teaching and preaching. And these fishermen are like, it's time to go home. Like, we got to go to sleep because we got to get up and do this whole thing over again. But Jesus tells them, he said, hey, you know what? Go cast your nets again. And just making this story real, right? When you've finished cleaning up after a project, when you've finished cleaning up after a long work day, are you trying to go back out and get the very thing of which you just used dirty again? 
When you finish a long day, David, at the, at the concrete plant and you, all your trucks are washed and clean, are you trying to be like, oh, let's fill them back up and go out again? No, you're trying to go home. Hey, maybe make more money if it does, but you don't want to because you got to keep working, right? And this is the reality is that they didn't want to dirty their nets again, but the Bible says in verse 4 that Jesus told them, launch out into the deep, let those clean nets that you just cleaned down for a catch. But Simon Peter answered him and said, Master, we have toiled all night and we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, your word I will let down the nets. What a beautiful, beautiful willingness of Simon to be able to say, hey, because you're asking us to, we're willing to do it. It doesn't make sense. We fished all night. We didn't catch anything. But because you're asking us to, we will be willing to do it. Part of the prayer of, Lord, open my eyes, begins with a willingness to even pray the prayer. I can stand up here all day long and say, Lord, open the eyes of the people here. But if you are not willing to have your eyes opened, they will not be opened. Elisha's servant's eyes were opened because he was willing. He had seen what Elisha had done many times. And he says, hey, open the eyes of my servant, and it happened. I would love for that to be the case, but there has to be a willingness for you to open your eyes. We see that here because it says, At the word of the Lord I will let down my nets. Verse 6. And when they had done this, they caught what? A great number as fish as so much their nets were breaking. What an amazing story of Scripture. What an amazing perspective that they were able to see what God was up to. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both of their boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell at Jesus' knee saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And also were with them were James, right? And it continues on with the story. When our eyes are opened spiritually... Our prayer becomes the same. We are astonished. We are amazed. We are bewildered. We are humbled with what God is doing and willing to do around us. When we pray the prayer, Lord, open my eyes, we see the folk that are interested. We see the folk that are willing. We see the folk that God loves even more than we do, and we have an opportunity to speak a word of encouragement to them. I'm praising God as a church for Heather Mascarenas opening her home and leading a Revelation Bible study. She felt impressed, saying, I don't know what I'm doing with the Revelation study, but I have a house, I have neighbors who are interested. Family, will you come and help us? And we're going to do a Revelation Bible study. And praise God, when our eyes are open, we see him working, and neighbors are responding from what I'm told. I'm, praying God, I'm praising God because as a church, our eyes are opening, and Dottie Cole was asked to lead a Bible study at the Heritage Place. And this last Wednesday night, she led a Bible study in her place with eight individuals going through Amazing Facts lesson number one. I'm praising God that when our eyes are open, we see the needs around us. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Dottie, and many others in our congregation, because when our eyes are open, we're willing to see how God is wanting to use us and is willing to bless our efforts. My appeal this morning is very, very simple. How many of you will join me today in praying the prayer, Lord, open my eyes?